everybody. Welcome to this weekend. I'm very excited about today. Before I dive into the message and continuing part two of Flesh and Blood, our series, I want to talk to you about two things, okay? First of all, the reopening physically of Hope and all of our campuses. Uh, it's a little less than a month away, September 12th and 13th, that weekend. Uh, we'll do one Saturday night here at East and then one service at 1115 at all the campuses, okay, including East. So one Saturday night and then at our campuses, 1115 service. Uh, we're gonna do an RSVP and if we have more than, than what we think we might have, which I hope is true, uh, then we'll adjust and we'll open up another service. Does that make sense? So be watching for that. The second thing is this coming Thursday, August 20th at 7 p.m., we're doing a Unity Table live stream. Now, I'm going to be with uh, a bunch of pastors from Collin County, uh, Pastor Conway over at One Community, and we're going to be live streaming just for 45 to 60 minutes, uh, just a, a kind of a a why behind the unity table. And if you don't know what the unity table is, just tune in, seven o'clock. I'll be sending you a link to that live stream this week. So be looking for that as well. So that's this Thursday, seven o'clock, just at your computer, uh, you know, on YouTube, whatever, watch and kind of figure out with us, learn about unity table. It's gonna be a great, great live stream and I'm looking forward to that. Okay, today, um, flesh and blood part, Two, let me give you a little review. This is Ephesians 6, really kind of talking about what Paul describes as the battle that we're in, spiritually speaking, and really in every way, the battle that we face as believers. It's, it's, it's not easy, right? And so last week, let me talk to you about where we uh, have been. We talked about the reality, which is we have sin, we deal with our flesh. In other words, our sinful nature, challenges of all kinds, diseases, trials, tragedies, problems, all those things are the reality. And just because you come to Jesus or just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean that all the realities go away. Right? I mean, it doesn't mean that we are promised perfection or uh, absolute favor all the time in our lives. We get what we want because we all know as our kids grow up, if you have kids, you know that they don't always get what they want. That's not good for them. So the reality though is we face these things, but we talked about the greater reality, right? We talked about the greater reality and that is that we have freedom over these things that we are justified over our sin nature, that we are loved even though we're not perfect, that we are accepted even though we are messy, that we are more than conquerors through what Jesus has done. So even though we live in a reality and we face battles of these things, the greater reality is the war has already been won. Does that make sense? So, Ephesians, when we talk about this, the reality is we don't fight against flesh and blood. So if you're in a, uh, a, a kind of a relationship issue, maybe it's a friendship deal, maybe it's a marriage deal, a former marriage, you know, all those things. Well, it's spiritual in nature. That battle is spiritual. And you may say, well, no, it's physical, man, because I can't stand him or I can't stand her. Well, we're talking about spiritual things though. We're talking about peace, which is a spiritual thing. We're talking about forgiveness, which is a spiritual thing. We're talking about walking in harmony and you know all those things, which are all spiritual. So every challenge, every battle, Paul describes it that way, is spiritual in nature, but the war is already won. The greater reality is bigger than our reality. Today, I wanna to talk to you about standing. Okay? I want to talk to you about what Ephesians and what Paul says in Ephesians 6 about to stand. He says it three times. Let me read it. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, 
so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to what? Stand your ground. And after you have done everything that you know to do, stand. He says that three times. And the question is not what is Paul saying? You know, because he, he says, hey, stand firm. In other words, hey, don't, don't give in to the battle. Don't give in to the enemy. Don't give in to your flesh. But he says, stand. And when you've done everything that you know to do, stand. Now, we understand what Paul is saying. How we stand is the question. Not do we stand, right? Not do we stand firm in faith and on the rock of Christ Jesus. You know, all those things are true, but have you ever noticed how difficult that really can be? Have you noticed how difficult living the life that you want to live, living the life that God calls us to live, how difficult that is? And that's why we're in this series. You may be struggling right now in, in real, real ways as we are facing this season like we've never faced before, most of us in our lifetime. This coronavirus and the economy and the election and racial tension and all these things that are coming at us, not to mention your own marriage, your family, your parents who are crazy, your kids who are crazy, your boss who's crazy, your team who's crazy, you who's crazy. I mean, we all have this challenge going on right in front of us so the reason I wanted to do this series right now is to help give us context to what we're facing, okay? Because we are facing a battle. We all know that. And Paul says to stand firm in your faith. Don't waver, stand. Now the question is, how do we do that? When, when we fail so many times, how do we do that when we fall so many times? How do we do that when we are challenged or our, um, our lives feel like it's being attacked all the time? Work, money, marriage, kids, all of it. What, how do we stand? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because Paul answers this question and he uses imagery to answer the question. Now, in Paul's day, it was very common for uh, people in Jerusalem, people in Galilee, people anywhere in the Middle East to see a Roman guard, a Roman soldier. Very common. And it was very common for them to have armor. Just like we have people in our day, whether they're police officers or firemen or people who wear uniforms, we're very used to the hat. We're very used to the badge or the gun or the whatever. That was very common for them to see a Roman soldier with his armor and he uses that image to help us understand that we're in a battle. Now, here's what I want you to do. Uh, because it's not common imagery for us, I want you to not get hung up on the armor part. In other words, okay, so, so I've got a, a breastplate of righteousness and, and I've got the shield of faith. And we get hung up on the shield, the sword, the shoes, the belt, the helmet. Don't get hung up on those things. It's just words. And we're gonna take the words of Paul because the words of Paul that he uses is how we stand in the middle of the battle. Does that make sense to you? I hope, that was a mouthful. I, I took way too much time on that, but I'm hoping you understand that these words are very important. Ephesians 6, let's read on verse 11. Stand, or verse 14, sorry. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now, let me repeat, the imagery used here is very good. We understand it because we've seen movies and, and so forth, but I want you to, to get away from that imagery and let's just look at the words. 
Okay, so I'm not even going to use the, the, the sword. I'm not going to use the shield. We're just going to talk about the words because understanding these words is how we're going to be able to stand against the enemy. How we're going to be able to stand in the middle of the battle. Number one is truth. Okay, belt of truth, right? So I said I wouldn't say that, but the truth and for me, so these are practical ways in which I'm interpreting what Paul is saying. There's so many ways. You can look in, in, in uh, you know, Bible commentaries and look at all the ways in which we can look at that. These are just my ways that I think of when I think of standing strong, the battle that we're facing. This is what I think of when I hear truth. That means to me, you, gotta, you need to know the truth. You need to know God's word. This is so important and foundational because God's word is the revelation that we have of God. It is the story of God in written form, the invitation of God in written form, the doctrine of God in written form, and knowing God's word is the truth. So when we have truth, when Paul says, hey, make sure you're walking in truth, that means Hey, know God's word. Hebrews 4.12 says it like this. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between what we want and what God wants. Between joint and marrow, it exposes, or ex yeah, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. See, knowing the word. So for this generation, and I know I've said this so many times, but I'm gonna say it again. For this generation, if there's one thing that I'm, pa well, there's many things about the next generation that I'm passionate about, but if I'm passionate about anything, it's knowing the word of God. You cannot ignore the word of God because so many of us, we, we base our lives on a feeling. We base on a, our lives on how we think about things, how we feel about things, rather than knowing God's word. And when you do that, you're going to be led astray. Because your feelings, your heart can deceive you. The word of God will never deceive you. And so knowing the word of God is the basis for truth. And when Paul says stand, this is the first thing he mentions. He says, make sure you're walking in truth. Number two, number two, righteousness, okay? This for me is focus on the greater reality. Okay, and I'll get to that circle in just a minute. Focus on the greater reality, 2 Corinthians chapter five. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, I want you to hear this, who had no sin to be sin for us. Okay, in other words, so, so another way to look at this is that righteousness is what Jesus did for us, Okay. In other words, he made us righteous. And the, the way that he did that is Jesus took upon himself on the cross our sin. And he took our sin so that we could be made righteous, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is where we get the greater reality. Let me put it on the screen. The greater reality, this is where we get freedom because of Jesus and what he did for us because we are righteous, not because of what we do. You and I both know that. It's because of what Jesus did, because of the freedom that he gave us, the justification that he gave us, that we are loved, accepted, and we are more than conquerors. The greater reality. So he says, Paul, he says, you want to stand against the battle, in the battle? You want to stand strong against the enemy? You got to know the truth and you got to walk in righteousness. Righteousness. You got to understand what Jesus has done for you. This is not about you and what you can do or what I can do. This is about him. This is the greater reality. And so he says, you walk in that righteousness and then you understand that there's no condemnation. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So when you deal with the reality of your sinful nature, remember that little circle over here, the reality of your mess, the reality of your bad decisions, the, I'm not giving you license for those things, I'm just saying that we all make them. The, re, the, the reality of those things are real. Jesus, the righteousness that he gave us, sets us free from the consequences of the law from the consequences of breaking the law. So good. Truth, righteousness. Number three. Number three is peace. He says, 
put on your shoes, peace. And I love that imagery because, because I think, this is what I think about when I think about peace. You choose, you walk, and you work for peace. You choose peace, you walk in peace, and you work for peace. John 14, 27, Jesus says it like this. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give you, or I give, is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. What is this saying to me? Hey, choose peace. I'm leaving you with a gift. It is a gift that the world cannot give. You won't find it in a bottle. You're not going to find it in a relationship. You're not going to find it in money. You will not find what Jesus and only he can bring if, in, in anything else but him. So choose peace. Then he says in Colossians 3, Paul says it this way, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. In other words, walk in this peace. Walk in what he has done for us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 says, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. Let me, let me just camp out here just for a second. This, this choosing peace in the middle of chaos, this walking in peace in the middle of relational difficulty, this working for peace in the middle of challenge is a choice. It doesn't mean the challenge goes away and it doesn't mean the relational difficulty doesn't go away. It just means that you've chosen to walk in peace, that you have chosen to walk in peace. I've chosen peace, I'm gonna walk in peace, and then you choose to work for it. In the Beatitudes in Matthew, Jesus says he blesses those who work for peace. Does, does this make sense how practical this is? Because we, we use the term spiritual warfare. And he's, you know, we, we look at what Paul says in the, in the beginning in, in, uh, of chapter six, verse 10 through 12, you know, we don't fight against flesh and blood, against principalities, powers, rulers, and authorities. And it all seems so mystical. Evil forces, the enemy, the devil, he uses the, those terms. So, so when we look at the armor of God, we just kind of feel like, man, you know, uh, I got to have a sword. I've got to have a shield. I've got to have uh, sandals. I've got to have a helmet. Hey, put those things aside and let's look at the words because the words are very practical. You want to win the battle? Walk in truth. Bottom line. You want to you win the battle? You walk in righteousness. You do what, you, you walk in what Jesus has given you. You want to win the battle? You choose, you walk, and you work for peace. And the battle is eliminated. The battle begins to go away. This is scripture, guys. This is so practical. Number four. Number four is faith. Now, I love this one. Choose faith over fear. So when I think of faith, there's so many things I think about. Practically speaking, okay, I think of choosing faith over fear. Let me explain in just a minute. I'm gonna give you a quote here on the screen at the end of these scriptures, so stay with me on this. But choosing faith over fear, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we live by faith, not by sight. So you may say, John, it's easy for you to say to walk in faith, but you don't know what just happened in my life. You don't know what just happened in my world. And you're right, I don't, but you don't know what's happened in mine. So we choose to not walk by what we're seeing right now, the tragedy, the challenge, the problem, the trial, and we choose to not just walk by what we see. Now, we don't disregard or we don't ignore. We don't you know, close our ears and say, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. We don't do that. We acknowledge the problem. We acknowledge the challenge. We acknowledge the tragedy. We cry, we weep, we mourn, all those things but we don't just walk by what we see. We walk by faith. We live by faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says it this way. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us an assurance about things we cannot see. We hope for what, what Jesus promised, eternal life. We hope for the heaven that he 
that he talks about. We hope for the Revelation 20, where he talks about no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more disease, no more, I wanna wipe away all those tears and I will be their God and I will walk among them. We hope for those things. That's what faith is. It's the confidence in that what we hope for will actually come to pass. It's walking by faith, not by sight. 2 Timothy 1.7 says it this way, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline, or in some translations, a sound mind. So here's, here's what I think of as, as far as a definition of faith. So walking by faith is this, choosing to trust God regardless of our circumstances. I don't know, that's so easy, right? I mean, it just makes sense, but it's like, well, that's easier said than done. Oh, totally. It's easier said than done for all of us. But this is how we stand in the battle. This is how we stand firm, is that we choose to trust God with our faith no matter what the sight looks like, no matter what happens, no matter the circumstances, we choose to trust God no matter what. No matter what. Number five. Number five, salvation. He throws this in here, and it's a good reminder similar to righteousness, but I'm gonna say it like this. We just remember what Jesus has done. So when you're fighting the battle, we just remember that Jesus, listen, Jesus has been through what we've been through. He's been tempted and actually he's been tempted a lot. He was, I mean, we know the story in Luke where, where Jesus was tempted for 40 days and the, the enemy came after him. We understand that what Jesus has done because he's walked in our shoes. Romans 5 verse 8 through 10 says it like this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We're talking about salvation here. Since we have now been justified by his blood, just as if we had never sinned, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him, through Jesus? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved, talking about salvation, through his life? Verse 37 of chapter eight says it like this. Knowing all these things, and I read this last week, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, Paul says, this is a doctrinal statement, that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is salvation. This is, this is understanding what Jesus has done for us. He's walked in our shoes. He knows what it's like to walk through our pain emotionally, physically, spiritually, any way, mentally. He knows what it's like. He's been here. He's done that. But he did it without sin. And because he did it without sin, he became our justification, just as if we had never sinned. And because of what Jesus has done, he has given us salvation. And we rest in that in the battle. Facing the battle, we rest in the salvation that Jesus has brought. Number six, Number six, talking about this practical way of standing firm in the battle, word of God. Now, I know I talked about this when we talked about truth, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about not just knowing the word, using the word of God. Does that make sense? So using the word of God, because that's what Jesus, remember when he was tempted? He used the word of God. When the enemy came to him and says, hey, turn that, that stone into bread, I know you're hungry. And he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. What was he saying? He was using the word. He was using the word. Every time that the enemy came to him, he used the word of God. So it's not just about knowing the word of God. And many of us, if you grew up in church, uh, went to VBS, got prizes for memorizing scripture, went to children's church, youth camp, you know the word of God, but there's one thing to know and there's one other thing to use it. That's why, listen, that's why studying the Bible, even now as an adult, you say, hey, I've been raised in church, my faith is good. John, I really don't like to read. I don't, I don't really read the word of God that much, but I hear it on Sundays and man, that just gets me through the day, it gets me through the week. Guys, can I just tell you 
how important it is not just to know the word, not just to know about the stories, but to use the word, to study the word. This is why we push you. This is why I beg you to get involved in Bible studies, classes, home groups, small groups, men's groups, women's groups. I, I encourage you to study the Bible. Here's what Paul says about it, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us, listen, what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. You want to stand firm in the battle? You want to stand firm? Use the word of God. The word of God teaches us what's right and it also corrects us when we're wrong. It corrects us when we, well, I just said that, when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it, listen, to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. You want to stand firm in the battle? You want to be practical about the armor of God? Forget the, the sword, forget the helmet, forget the belt, forget the sandals, forget all that. Focus on the words that he's using. And that's where the key is the word of God, not just knowing it, using it, study it. Number seven, last one, last one is prayer. Now, many don't include this in the armor because it's not a physical imagery, part of what Paul was saying, but I'm gonna include it because I think it is the lifeline for all of us. Prayer is the lifeline for all of us. Philippians chapter four, verse six, it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, what does he say? Pray about everything. Can I just submit to you, and I'm including myself, that many times when we face a challenge, when we face a battle, one of the last things we do is pray. One of the first things we do is worry. One of the first things we do is we go talk to a friend. One of the first things we do is we make an appointment with our counselor. Love all that. Those things are totally fine. One of the last things we really, really do, and many times we say, yeah, I've been praying about that. We have not been praying about that. We've been thinking about it. We haven't submitted it to the Lord. Does it make sense? And I'm not judging you. Hey, I'm, I'm in here with you. Yeah, I've told you many stories about the, my failures of prayer and, and making it a last resort kind of thing. We all do it. But when we're talking about standing our ground, in the battle, he says, hey, don't worry. Don't worry about your circumstances. Don't worry about the things that, listen, you cannot change. Pray about them. Just pray. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 17, here's what he says. Never stop praying. That's a scripture. I mean, I mean that sounds unrealistic, right? But this is, this is a lifestyle of prayer. So when we talk about practically walking, let me say it a different way, practically standing our ground, you know, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Stand your ground. Our, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers, and authorities in the heavenly realms. So when we talk about standing our ground, we've always kind of, or at least I have, made it to where, man, I got to put my helmet on every day. Man, I got to put my belt on. And I've got, and that's all right to walk through those things. But can I just tell you that don't think of the helmet. Don't think of the belt. Don't think of the breastplate. Don't think of the sword. Don't think of the shield, the sandals. Think of the words and think of how practical these words really are. Walking in truth, walking in righteousness, walking in peace, walking in faith. Does it make sense? This is not rocket science. You don't have to be 50 years old in the Lord to understand all these things. It's really simple. It's just hard to do. It's simple to understand, hard to do. But this is how Paul instructs us to stand firm in the battle. So let me end it with this. Let me put some statements on the screen to total this thing up, to, to wrap this thing up that I think will help. You ready? Here's the first. Standing firm in the spiritual battle is not about our strength, our courage, or our ability. Let me just keep it right there for, just for a second. 
Standing firm in the spiritual battle, because I think many of us, many of us, man, man, I got to do better. Man, I got to, I got to take my stand, and I've got to, uh, you know, do this and do that. It's almost like you got to put a big S on your on your chest to say, I am super Christian. I can do these things, guys. Everybody, look at me. Everybody, look at me. You can't. You and I will fail. We fall. That's the reality. We have a sinful nature. We have a flesh, we have trials and challenges and all kinds of problems. We have battles. The enemy comes at us, attacks the flaming darts or arrows that we have to, listen, we can't do this in and of ourselves. So standing firm is not about us being super, okay? But let me tell you what it is about. It is about the decisions we make on a regular basis to pursue the spiritual as much as we pursue the physical. Now that may sound like, well, okay, what? Okay, it is, it is about the decisions that we make. Let's say it's not about being perfect. It's not about us being superhero Christian, but it is about the day-to-day, -day, listen to me, don't tune me out. It is about the day-to-day -day decisions that we make to walk in truth to walk in righteousness, to walk in peace, to walk in faith, to walk in the word, to walk in righteousness, to walk in our salvation. This, these are the decisions that we make on a daily basis to pursue the spiritual as much as we pursue the physical. What do I mean? You like to eat? How many like to eat? I love to eat. Love going out to eat. Love Tex-Mex. Love it. Love it. I love riding my motorcycle. You love playing golf. You love playing tennis. You love watching movies. You love all those things. Okay. And those are not wrong. Okay, so don't, don't misunderstand me what I'm saying here. But what I am saying, and what I think really Jesus kind of gave us a secret when he was uh, fasting in the desert and the battle came to him. What was he doing? He was doing spiritual things. And if you only do physical things and expect to win and stand strong in the battle, you're deceiving yourself. You have to do spiritual things, pursue spiritual as much as you pursue physical. Does this make sense to you? I'm not saying you have to read your Bible as much as you go to work. I'm not saying those, it's not, it's not about that. It's just about heart and desire and decisions that you and I make about the people that we hang around, about the people who have influence in our lives, about the, the media that has influence in our lives. It has all about, it's all about those decisions that help us to stand firm in the battles that we face because the battles are gonna continue to come. We just gotta know how to stand firm in them. And it's not rocket science and it's not, you know, uh, armor, they're spiritual pursuits of truth. Let me put them on the screen. Can I put them on the screen? Do I have a list of the, of the yeah, truth, number two, righteousness, number three, peace, number four, faith, number five, salvation, number six, word of God, and number seven, prayer. Pursue these things and you will stand firmer than you're standing now I promise you that pursue these things Lord your word is so practical it is so good and I think many of us miss because of some ways and maybe which we were taught or Maybe we've gotten hung up on being soldiers and in battle is maybe more of a physical thing. God, help us to understand, to pursue the words that will help us to, to pursue the spiritual, uh, the spiritual things that will cause us to stand firm in the battle. And when we have done everything that we know to do to stand, 
God, I pray for those right now who are watching, who are far from you for whatever reason, who have never accepted the salvation that we talked about. You've, you've never maybe accepted that salvation. I pray for those watching right now that have never really said yes to you. I pray that Lord today would be their day. And God, I pray for those believers that feel like the reality is so much bigger than the greater reality. The sin in our lives is so much bigger than the freedom in our lives. The problems in our lives are so much bigger than the peace in our lives. God, may we see with spiritual eyes. May we walk by faith and not by sight. May we pursue the spiritual as much as we pursue the physical. And in so doing, may we stand strong in our faith. May we stand strong in the battle. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen.